John 13, uh, sorry, John 14 from verse 1. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how, how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time? Anyone who's seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father, and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept him, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourselves to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them, Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. This is the word of the Lord. We are in deep waters this morning in this passage. I'm going to pray again. All oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his past beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord. Father God, please give us insight into the depths of who you, who you are in your very being as we look at this together now. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, last week we started a teaching uh, series, a short series in, uh, to prepare for Easter by looking at the life that flows from the events that take place at Easter. And uh, by looking at John 13 to 17 and the teaching and prayers of Jesus on the night before he went 
to the cross. Uh, And John's gospel is all about life. It's about life uh, that comes from Jesus. If you want to truly live, if you want to really be alive, if you want to know what life to the full is, and you want to know that life that begins now and stretches on into eternity, that can only come from Jesus. It's not found in relationships. It's not found in children. It's important to recognize that, even as we celebrate Mother's Day. It's not found in success. It's not found in wealth. It's not found in experience. It's not found in security. It's not found in knowledge. It is found only in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. You may think your life is great. I can promise you, It's not worth comparing to the life you're offered in Jesus. And so John explains, uh, chapter 20, verse 31, that the reason he is writing this account about Jesus is so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And so he begins his gospel by introducing us to Jesus as the eternal word, the one who was with God and was God from the beginning, through the one through whom all things were made. Jesus, the creator, the author, the origin, the giver of all life. And then throughout the gospel, Jesus meets people in all sorts of different situations. They're bringing all sorts of different things, and he repeatedly offers them life. John 10 verse 10, life to the full eternal life which he declares John 17 verse 3 comes from knowing the only true God through his son Jesus Christ eternal life is to know the only true God through his son Jesus Christ And so some of you may be asking, even now, even in your minds right now, you may be asking in some way or another, well then, show me God. If eternal life comes from knowing God, then please, would you show me who this God is? Has that ever been the cry of your heart? I wonder, maybe it's a cry in your heart right now. Show me God. And it's a question one of Jesus' disciples asks in our passage. Jesus has just declared, chapter 14, verse 6, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. That no one comes to the Father except through him. Life with the Father through the Son. And so, verse 8, Philip says, then show us the Father. Maybe he's expecting some kind of burning bush mo. I don't know why... Some burning bush moment. That would be cool, wouldn't it? Maybe he's expecting some kind of burning bush moment. Maybe he's expecting some kind of Isaiah 6 moment. You know, those times in the scriptures where God uh, reveals himself to someone in his glory and they, and they fall down in front of him. Maybe, maybe he'd heard about Peter and James and John on the mountain as Jesus is transfigured and they hear the word of the Father say, this is my son. Maybe, maybe Philip's thinking, yes, I'd like to see that. But here's the thing, here's the revelation, here's the transfiguration, the glory revealing moment in John's gospel. Verse 9, Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Verse 7, know Jesus, then you know the Father. Verse 10, hear the words of Jesus, then you've heard the words of the Father. Verse 13, the Father is glorified in the Son. Even into chapter 15 and verse 23, if you hate the Son, then you hate the Father. Jesus and the Father are truly one. They are inseparable. They are distinct. They are two different persons, the Father and the Son, and yet they are one. If you want to see God, if you want to know God, then you must see and know Jesus. And so then Jesus introduces us to someone. Verse 16, Jesus introduces Philip, he introduces the disciples, he introduces us to the Holy Spirit. Have you uh, ever had that experience where uh, you're, you're being introduced to someone that you think is for the first time, and yet you've got that nagging sense that, oh, I think I've met this person before. 
Um, what's more annoying is when they remember meeting you and you don't remember meeting them. It happened to me at a conference recently. This guy uh, comes over, he says hello, he seems very pleased to see me, and I'm thinking, yep, there's something there, but I can't quite remember. And uh, it turns out I sat next to him in an Old Testament theology seminar for a whole year. It was, it was very embarrassing. I felt very bad, and I get particularly annoyed when people do that to me. So it was a, it was a humbling moment. But, but that idea of being introduced to someone new, but you feel like you already know them, that's what's going on here as Jesus introduces the Holy Spirit. Because it's not the first time the Holy Spirit has, been, uh, has shown up. We haven't got the time to do it this morning, but you go through the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit is there. The Spirit of the Lord is there. And Jesus has already been talking about him in John's Gospel. John 3, you must be born again by the Spirit. John 4, the the Father is seeking those that will worship him in spirit and in truth. John 7, verse 37, rivers of living water will flow through us as the Spirit comes after Jesus' death. And yet the Holy Spirit is now being introduced by Jesus in a new way, maybe a, a more open way, a more personal way, a clearer way than ever before. He's been there all along, but now it's different. The coming of the Spirit is a game changer for the people who want to know God and want to enjoy the life that comes from knowing the one true God through His Son, Jesus. Now go back to when you're first introduced to someone. Normally in that first meeting you will find out the most important information about them, the kind of foundation about who they are. What's their name? Where are they from? Do they have children? What do they do for a living? How do they know the person who's introducing uh, you to them? And, And this is so important for us to see because there is so much speculation and confusion and wrong focus and at times, quite frankly, some unfounded and unbiblical rubbish that gets talked about when it comes to the Holy Spirit. So this is important because it's foundational information that we are given about who the Holy Spirit is. And so what does Jesus tell us as he introduces us to the Holy Spirit? Well, first he tells us that he is an advocate. Another way of saying that is he is a helper. The title was often used in Jesus' time of someone, a friend, that would come and support you in court. I've done it twice in a magistrate's court. I've, I've gone to support someone who's defending themselves uh, to provide a kind of reference for them, a, a character reference for them. Uh, I'm not the legal expert, but I am there on behalf of my friend, on behalf of that person, to support them. It's sort of that, that, that idea is going on here in this word advocate. The Holy Spirit is someone who's going to come and is going to walk alongside Jesus' followers to help and support them. You can see that in what Jesus says in the following verses. He says, verse 16, the Father will send you another advocate to help you and be with you. And then verse 17, he lives with you. He's going to be there with you. He's going to walk alongside you. He's a friend, a companion, a supporter, a strengthener, a helper. Someone who loves us. Someone who lives with us. Someone who sounds an awful lot like Jesus. Do you notice Jesus said there, another advocate. Another advocate. Jesus is going away from them. He's going to God, so God is going to send them another advocate. Jesus was one type. A friend a companion, a strengthener who came literally in the flesh to walk alongside us and now the Father is going to send another. Like Jesus, but not Jesus. This person is the same type of person, but distinct, a different person. Two things to notice. Number one, the Holy Spirit is a person. He is a he See that there in verse 17. The world cannot accept him because it neither neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. 
two things that annoy me. Actually, there are lots of things that annoy me. Two things that came to mind this week. One, when people refer to revelation as revelations. It's revelation. Just going to leave that with you. Uh, Number two, when people refer to the Holy Spirit as an it. When they depersonalize the Holy Spirit. When they refer to him as a thing. Some sort of impersonal force or mystical spirit. No, he is a person. He is like Jesus. He is like the Father. He may not have a body like Jesus, but he is a person like Jesus. He is not some distant, impersonal force from a distant, impersonal God. No, He is a person that comes to live with us. And He is like Jesus. He is God. He is divine. That's the second thing we need to realize about the Holy Spirit. He is a person, but He is a divine person. We're talking here about the third person of the Godhead. That the one true God who Jesus wants us to know is a God who is in three persons. Not three parts of God. Not not God divided up into three ways. No, one God in three persons. Each is a distinct person. The Father is not the Son. The Father is not the Spirit. Uh, the, the, The Son is not the Spirit. The Son is not the Father and so on and so on. They are distinct and yet they are also in no way separate. They are one. Union but not fusion. One God in Trinity. Trinity in unity. And so we can say that there is one God... That God is three persons and that each person is fully God. Now think about that. Hold that in your mind as you hear Jesus say in verse 17 that the Holy Spirit will live with you and will be in you. Game changer. God is not just dwelling with us. God is dwelling in us. That's got to be a game changer, right? Yeah? Some of you don't seem convinced that the almighty God, the creator of heaven and earth, the one who is before time and will go on after time, the one who made everything, sustains everything, who controls everything, who knows everything, who is the greatest power in all of the universe, who came and sacrificed himself for you, you don't seem to believe that being in you is a game changer. Is it a game changer? Man, you get me to work hard sometimes. You really, I do. And then the last part of his introduction that, that Jesus gives to the Spirit is that the Spirit is a Spirit of truth. And I think that reinforces the divine nature of the Spirit, his, his closeness to Jesus. Jesus has just said in verse 6 that he is the truth. And now he introduces us to the Spirit of truth. Back in John 4, Jesus said that he is seeking people who will worship him in spirit and in truth. So what does Jesus mean when he introduces the spirit as the spirit of truth? I think he means that this is the spirit who communicates truth. He communicates truth. We can see that in in the two other times in this this section where where Jesus describes the Spirit as the Spirit of truth. So so John 14 verse 26, the Spirit of truth will test, sorry, John 15 verse 26, the Spirit of truth will testify about Jesus. John 16 verse 13, the Spirit of truth will guide the disciples in all truth. The Holy Spirit is the one who reveals the truth about Jesus, who will lead us in the truth of Jesus, who will help us to walk uh, in the truth of Jesus. He comes alongside us to help us to do it. He is in us to give us the heart to do it. He brings that deep truth into our hearts as he lives in us. So let Jesus introduce you to the Holy Spirit, the divine person who comes alongside us as our advocate to lead us in all truth and as he does, brings us into the life of God himself. 
Verse 18, before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Are you alive this morning? Good, that was much more affirmative than earlier. I'm pleased you know you're alive. Why are you alive? Are you alive because you're breathing? Are you alive because your heart is beating? Are you alive because metabolism is going on in your cells at the moment? Are you alive because neurons are working across your brain? Well, is it just a case of, I think, therefore I am? And on one level, all of that is true. They're all signs of life. If a, if a doctor was to come in here this morning to check if you're still alive, that's the sort of thing they might want to check. But all of us will know, won't we, that living is more than that. It's more than biological processes. Look there at what Jesus says at the end of verse 19. Because I live, you also will live. Remember the context of this conversation that Jesus is having here with his disciples. It it began in John 13 verse 1. Jesus knew that his hour had come. He knew that the hour of the cross had come. The hour of his death had come. The hour of his resurrection and return to his father had come. Jesus is going to die. Verse 19. Before long the world will not see me anymore. And yet Jesus lives. He's alive. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. Jesus is pointing us to the greatest day, right? What day was that? The resurrection. He's alive. He's risen from death to eternal life. And because Jesus is alive, so are we. This life that Jesus is talking about here is not the physical life you're living now. It's the resurrection life. It's the life that raises people from death to life to eternal life. And yes, that will be eternal physical life. But it goes beyond oxygen and metabolism and brain function. To be alive is to be as Jesus is alive. To be alive is to be in perfect fellowship for eternity with the Father. That is what it means to be really alive. It goes goes far beyond those things to life in Jesus because Jesus is alive. Amen? Amen? Life forever lived in fellowship with the Father. Verse 19, second half of verse 19 Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in the Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. That is an incredible statement. It's an incredible statement. Jesus says, I am in the Father. He's talking about how he, as God the Son, has enjoyed this perfect and uninterrupted love and fellowship with the Father, perfectly one in eternity. So this is the one true God who exists in three persons, where each person is fully God, but they are perfectly one. Outside of time, the Father and the Son have been in Perfect unity. They've enjoyed perfect fellowship. They've shared a perfect love. Before the creation of the world, before time came into existence, in eternity, God the Father was loving God the Son, and God the Son was loving God the Father. It's glorious, isn't it? It's it's beautiful. It's praiseworthy. It's why we can say God is love. Not that God can love, not that God invented love, not that God is loving, but that God is love. In his very being, he is love. The most straightforward answer you can give to anybody who asks you, who is God or what is God like, is God is love. Now, sadly, in our culture, that needs a thousand qualifications because we've got a really skewed idea about what love is. Oh, love is love. I mean, what does that even mean? It's a ridiculous thing to say. You should tell someone who says it. Love is love. It's a ridiculous thing to say. What do you mean? You want to know what love is? Look at who God is. God is love. It's 
that the God you know? You, you might know him as a mighty creator, as all-powerful, all-knowing, as the judge of all, as the holy one. And he is gloriously all those things. But do you know him as a God of love? Who has been in a perfect relationship of love in eternity. And as an outpouring of that perfect love, he invites us into that love. Because not only is Jesus in the Father, but we are in Jesus and he is in us. The incredible thing about this statement is that if Jesus in the, is in the Father and we are in Jesus, then through Jesus we enjoy this love and fellowship with the Father. The Father loves you in the same way He loves Jesus. That's the incredible thing. He loves you in the same way He loves the Son, the Father loves you like He loves Jesus. Full, overflowing, committed, eternal, perfect love poured out on you through the Son. And we enjoy the life of the eternal God. The same fellowship that Jesus has enjoyed with the Father in eternity. We are now invited into that life for eternity. We're brought into this eternal fellowship of life because Jesus lives and he lives in us. Amen. But notice how we enter into this life. Verse 17, second half of verse 17. But you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. We live because the spirit lives in us. We live, yes, because Jesus lives, but, but that life is brought into our lives, into our hearts by the Spirit who reveals to us these glorious truths that we're, we're seeing here this morning, who helps us to see Jesus as the risen and ascended Son of the living God and who joins our lives to His by faith. As the Spirit lives in us, we are alive in Jesus. Now this, my friends, is at the edge of my ability to communicate, to fully grasp, to totally understand. I, I said we are in deep waters. I feel like I've been submerged under them for a lot of this week. Some of you have been praying very hard for me, and I thank you for that. It is so deep, it is so immense, it is so wonderful. But all I can encourage you to do is to read John's Gospel more. To see how Jesus describes his relationship with the Father. To see the joy that that relationship brings him. To see the strength that he draws from that relationship. So I'm not going to tell you to, to do anything more this morning than to believe in this truth. To believe that this is the relationship that you enjoy with the Father if you have come to him through the Son and you've been in, united to him by the Spirit. To know the life that you have living in Jesus. Believe it. Meditate on it. Meditate it on John's gospel so that it might fill you with the same joy and it might strengthen you and secure you in the same way that it did for Jesus. And as we do that, as we understand and abide more in this life, that life will be seen in us. It's an interesting question that Judas uh, asks. Not the, not the Judas that betrays Jesus, the other Judas. It's a bit like we have three Andrews here. Uh, Jesus had two Judases, okay? Um, Judas asks this really interesting question in verse 22. He says, but Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not the world? Now, I'm not going to look at the kind of what goes on to lead up to that question, what prompts Judas to ask it, but the answer to the question is really straightforward. Jesus is revealed to the world. He is seen in his people. He's seen in his people. And what that looks like visibly to others is it looks like, verse 23, loving obedience. So, Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, anybody who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. 
It's repeating something that Jesus has already said in verse 15. If you love me, keep my commands. We obey Jesus, his commands, what he instructs us to do because we love him. Because we love him. And obedience in John's gospel is not so much about following kind of specific commands like we saw in the Sermon on the Mount. Obedience to Jesus in John's gospel is focused more on this idea of abiding in Jesus, of resting in Jesus, of seeking Jesus as the way, the truth and the life, of believing in Jesus as the resurrection and the life, of trusting him and listening to him and following him as the good shepherd of your souls. It's coming to him as the one who brings living water into your soul so that you will never thirst again. I'm going to think more about this when we get to John 15, but obedience involves trusting in Jesus, abiding in him as the source of true life, resting in him as the one who secures us in eternal life. Now, yes, out of that flows obedience to the commands that we we saw in the Sermon on the Mount. As we abide in Jesus, we will bear much fruit, he says, but But that obedience flows from uh, uh, resting in Jesus, abiding in Jesus, knowing the love of Jesus. As Jesus lives in us, we love Jesus. And so we obey Jesus. And that life is then on display for all the world to see. Jesus shows himself to the world through the joyful, obedient love-filled, spirit-indwelt lives of his people. The joyful, obedient, love-filled, spirit-indwelt lives of his people. Friends, loved ones, ones loved by Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Obedience flows from love. So we need to keep dwelling on the love of Jesus for us and the love of Jesus in us. And that happens, that is enabled by the Spirit. Verse 26, But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I said to you. It's the Spirit, it's the, it's the Advocate walking alongside us, helping us, working in us, teaching us and reminding us of all that Jesus has taught, about all uh, Jesus taught about who he is, about what he did and about what he's doing now, about how we're to live in the light of the truth of that. All of that is communicated to our hearts by the Spirit. We are enabled to know and obey and love Jesus by the Spirit. Some of you know I've been uh, working through a series of uh, meditations on some of the sayings of Jesus in John's Gospel. And I I got to the end of it on Friday, and it was not a comfortable time. I've loved the book. It's been full of really encouraging things. I get to the last chapter, and I'm like, oh, that hurt a bit. And, 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 And right at the end of John's Gospel is again this idea of the obedience to Jesus flowing from a love for Jesus. So some of you will know the story. Uh, Peter, um, uh, he's enjoyed this wonderful breakfast with Jesus. There's been a a miraculous fishing expedition and and Jesus is on the shore and he's cooking fish and he eats breakfast with the disciples and and, and Peter is walking along the road with Jesus by the shore and, and Jesus asks him something three times. What does he ask him? Do you love me? Now, I want you to think for a second, if, if someone asked you that question three times in quick succession, how would you feel? You know, if your wife or husband says to you, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you really love me? You're going to start to get offended that they are questioning the sincerity of your love for them, aren't they? And Peter here, he's like, come on, give me, I, I love you. Do you love me? Are you sure you love me? Do you really love me? Well, just know that Jesus isn't asking this because he, he's not sure. He, he doesn't know how Peter feels. He, he's Jesus. He knows exactly how Peter feels. 
Jesus is asking Peter because he wants Peter to know how he feels. He wants Peter to reflect and to be sure, do you love me? And Peter is emphatic, isn't he? Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And how does Jesus finish? He says, follow me. If you love me, Jesus says, then follow me. If you love me, obey my commands. And this was the uncomfortable bit. What if Jesus was to ask me that question? Three times. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? It's an uncomfortable Friday morning. As I thought about Jesus asking me that question three times. And I hesitantly said in my heart, yes, but not as much as I know I should. And not as much as I know that I want to. I want to love you more. And so what can you do? Pray. Pray. If love for Jesus, if knowing the love of Jesus, if if knowing the life of Jesus in you is a work of the Spirit, then all you can do is pray. Pray that God, by His Spirit, would enable you to love Jesus, really love Jesus, truly love Jesus, as you know and understand more of the love of Jesus for you. So keep reflecting on this passage. Dive deep into its waters. Keep asking God to fill you with a knowledge of his love so that your love for Jesus will deepen and so that the glory of Jesus might be seen in us and through us. Life that flows from Easter. John 13, we see how much Jesus loves us. That he loves us to the very end that he loves us all the way to the cross. And John 14, the Spirit brings that love of Jesus into our hearts as Jesus lives in us and as we live for Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, we see the wonder of the love of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. The love that you have shared for one another in eternity past and will do into eternity future. We see that love that drove the Son to perfect obedience, joyful obedience, even to the cross. And we see that love overflowing out to us. And the invitation to come and enjoy it through Jesus. Would you please, as we see these things this morning, help us to love Jesus more. To love him as much as it's possible to love him. To love you, Father, Son, and Spirit, with all our hearts, with all our minds, with all our soul, and with all our strength as your spirit works in us and lives in us. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.